Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Project Speed webinar uh, today on the 21st of July. This is the uh, fourth event in a series. We had a conference back in February and we've had two earlier events looking at the individual parts of the speed program. There's nine initiatives within the speed program and we're looking at the last three today. Uh, so today we're going to, going to be talking about interoperability, procurement, and the third, uh, the third uh, part of the program today is access and, and possessions. We have lots of opportunity to, for you to ask questions. Uh, there's a Q&A uh, facility uh, in, within Teams at the top of your screen, so please feel free to ask questions. We'll have a good amount of time uh, to ask our speakers questions. Uh, I'll, if you put, can put the questions in, in the Q&A dialogue, I'll ask the, uh, the speakers the questions. Uh, uh, the, uh, there will also be some polls during the presentation and all will become clear as to how those work. So um, if um, without any further ado, if I can introduce our first speaker, I've got the great pleasure of welcoming Jeremy Hotchkiss, Deputy Director, Rail Industry Standards and Capability at the Department for Transport. And Jeremy is going to remind us of uh, what pro Rail Project Speed is all about. So Jeremy, can I hand over to you? Jeremy, are you are you able to uh, unmute and bring your camera up? There we are. Hello, can you see me now? Apologies there. Mm -hmm. Not to worry, Jeremy. Yeah, we can. We're getting you loud and clear now. So if I can, if I can hand over to you uh, to remind us of the purpose of Rail Project Speed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, David. And good afternoon to everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, as David said, this is um, part of a number of um, Rail Speed events for the supply chain, um, which were kicked off uh, with the Speed Conference in February. Um, and thank you very much to David and to Ria. Um, for hosting these events for, for DFT and for Network Rail. Um, I'm Jeremy Hotchkiss. I'm a Deputy Director of Rail Industry Standards and Capability within DFT, um, and I lead a division that's responsible for many of the department's policies towards the rail supply chain, including the rail sector deal and rail innovation. Um, I also cover rail safety regulation and interoperability, uh, which is one of the themes for today's discussion. Um, before we get into the meat of today's topics, I'd just like to remind us all why we're here. So some of you will have been to the um, Rail Speed Conference in February and heard the Prime Minister and the Rail Minister highlight the vital role that the government sees rail playing in building back better from the pandemic, levelling up the country and helping us to reach net zero carbon. And I hope the scale of our ambition is clear to you further um, to the plans that DFT has published over the last couple of months. Um, the Williams Shapps plan for rail outlined our vision to transform the railway with a new model of pro public private partnership in great British railways. What we want to do here is to take the very best that the private sector brings to the railways. So innovation and unrelenting focus on quality, outstanding customer service, and fuse it with a single guiding mind that can really drive benefits and efficiencies across the whole rail system. The White Paper's vision seeks more private sector investment and involvement in the railway than has occurred over the last 25 years. And for the first time, the railway will be guided by a 30 year whole industry strategic plan, um, or WISP, as it's known in the department, which I know the supply chain has sought for some time. The Transport Decarbonisation Plan and Rail Environment Policy Statement also set out our strategy for achieving a zero carbon railway by 2050. And this includes a commitment to deliver an ambitious, sustainable and cost effective programme of electrification 
guided by network rails traction decarbonisation network strategy. We will seek to incorporate modern methods of electrification, including discontinuous overhead electrification and safer technology to help us decarbonise more quickly and cost effectively. Uh, we'll also explore where short infill electrification projects could enable rail freight operators to switch services to electric traction. Soon, uh, we plan to publish an integrated rail plan for the North and Midlands. And this plan will detail how we integrate conventional and high speed rail projects, improving connectivity in the regions where it's most needed. We'll also soon publish the Rail Network Enhancement pipe Pipeline, or RNEP, which will provide the forward look on enhancement schemes. I know that the supply chain has been eagerly awaiting both of these um, documents. So the ambition is there and with it comes the prospect of many opportunities for the rail supply chain. But turning ambition into reality really crucially hinges on delivering rail infrastructure more cost effectively, more efficiently and more product more productively. And for far too long, Rising taxpayer subsidy and growing passenger numbers have masked inefficiencies and outdated working practices. All too frequently, we've seen, seen rail infrastructure projects um, run over time and over budget. This is unsustainable and it's never been something we were willing to accept as the norm. So if we're to deliver the full scale of our ambition in rail, and create the associated opportunities for the supply chain, we need to make taxpayer money go much further. And that means we can't continue working in the same ways that we've done in the past. And that really brings us to project speed, because rail uh, or change in rail requires industry and government to work together. And that's why we launched Rail Speed last year with Network Rail. Together, we identified a number of key areas where government and network rail could take com complementary actions to achieve swift, pragmatic and efficient enhancement de delivery. And those obviously provide the, uh, the, the, the title of the project, Project Speed. So speed is already significantly reducing the time and cost of building the railway, delivering passenger benefits faster reducing disruption to the rail network and saving taxpayers money. Speed is also cutting through layers of process and bureaucracy that have little value um, and also in doing so freeing up colleagues time to do to focus on doing the things that really matter safely. Every rail infrastructure project will now apply speed ways of working um, with the aim of saving billions of pounds and cutting years off delivery. So it simply becomes embedded in how we get the job done. And Speed will also help deliver an industry that trusts knowledge and values expertise, doesn't follow rules at the expense of common sense or better outcomes, and is filled with people who are proud, capable and excited to work in rail. So that really brings us on to the, the topics of today's session. And today we're going to discuss three speed themes that I know are of interest to the rail supply chain, interoperability, procurement and access. Both interoperability and procurement are linked to regulatory regimes that we inherited from the EU and Brexit has created an opportunity for us to reform these regimes to better serve our national interests. In the short term through speed, we found many ways to work more efficiently within the existing regulatory frameworks. For example, on access and possessions, there's already great collaborative working between DFT, network rail, the rail supply chain and rail operators as well. And last year, DFT asked the rail supply group to identify a number of Act Now priorities to support the sector's recovery from COVID. Changing railway access arrangements was one of the top three priorities identified. And it's excellent that this work has been incorporated into speed. Now, ultimately, DFT and Network Rail can't achieve the aims of Project Speed on our own. 
we need to work together as one team and involve you as a supply chain in that work. So we want to engage with you on the speed work streams so that the approaches that we take are informed by supplier insight. Today's session is intended to be interactive as we're very keen to hear your views on the speed themes and whether we've concentrating on the right areas for change. And importantly, we also invite you to reflect on your own company's practices, processes and behaviours. Consider which of your own ways of working are not adding value or are out of date. Where could you make changes that would help to reduce costs and delays to rail enhancement projects? Now, rail speed doesn't exist in isolation and is very much part of the wider efficiency and productivity agenda. So through the rail supply group, DFT and Network Rail continue to work with the supply chain and supply chain organisations such as RIA on improving productivity to achieve the rail sector deal goal of a whole industry, whole system unit cost significantly lower than the current UK conventional infrastructure only costs. And we've committed to do that by 2025. That goal has renewed significance. Um, so we will agree a target with Great British Railways to bring down its overall costs and benchmark these against global standards. And we intend to hold it to account for achieving this within its financial settlement. We've also established an acceleration unit within DFT to support programme and policy teams across all transport modes in speeding up the delivery of infrastructure projects and in implementing new policy initiatives. These are very clearly aligned with the cross-government project speed, which is developing proposals to deliver public investment projects more strategically and efficiently, ensuring governments building the right things better and faster. This is very much driven by the Prime Minister's aim of rebuilding the UK economy and delivering infrastructure better, greener and faster. So I think that's all I was going to say at the start by way of introduction. I think in summary, we're ambitious about rail. We need to do things differently, significantly reducing costs and time. We all have a, a role to play in this. and We very much look forward to working more closely with the rail supply chain as we move forward. So thank you very much all and back to David. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for a very comprehensive uh, introduction, setting out, out the landscape. And we too look forward to uh, continuing to work closely with, with the department on, on, on these matters. Uh, you, you set out a you know, really um, clear and ambitious agenda for, for rail, rail going forward. Um, quite a lot of questions, I think, might come from that, but we've got the Q&A after your interoperability session. So if we may, we might we might get into a few of those more strategic questions uh, in the in the interoperability part of uh, uh, of the conversation. But uh, what I was really interested to hear you say that every project will now apply speed. So that just illustrates the importance of our discussions today and in the previous meetings. So uh, conscious of the time and, and that we'll have Q&A time later, I'm going to move on to uh, introducing uh, jo uh, um, Jeremy's colleague, uh, jo Joe Griffiths, also uh, from the DFT, uh, so, sorry, from Network Rail, uh, uh, Senior Program Engineering Manager, Network Rail. So um, Jeremy and Joe are going to take us through um, the uh, topic of interoperability uh, from a speed context. And so I'll hand over to Jeremy. I think you're taking it away and sharing your slides now. Um, so heads up to the audience. There will be some polls in this. So a bit of audience participation uh, in, in due course. So watch out for that. Uh, Jeremy, over to you. Thank you very much. You're, you're muted, Jeremy. OK, there we are. I have unmuted and I have shared my slides. And the question is, can you see the right slides? Yeah, all good. Excellent. Great. OK, so without um, more ado, um, this session is particularly uh, relates to rail interoperability and its relevance to project speed. So 
I'll be doing this jointly with Joe, um, who, as David said, works in Network Rail, and we've been working very, very closely with Joe and team over the last few months in this area. So, um, let's see if I can move on to the next slide. So, outline of the presentation. Um, I'm going to start with a brief introduction to interoperability, then I'm going to hand over to Joe to dis discuss the trial that we've been running as part of Project Speed. I'll then finish by saying a little bit about our post implementation review uh, of um, interoperability. Um, I hope the slides are moving, but please tell me if um, if they're not. So there will be a number of interactive questions during the presentation and we will aim to show the answers in real time on the screen if the technology works uh, and we have been practicing this. Um, links to these questions are going to be in the chat bar, so if you have this open and ready, um, then we'll be able to run these questions in real time. So I shall kick off now briefly um, and there should be time for questions at the end. So I'm going to start with a very brief introduction to the subject area and I'm going to start with a brief question. Which is this. What is the correct definition of rail interoperability? And you should be able to answer this using the, the link on your slides and I hope it's come up on the screen. So it's a multiple choice question here. <laughs> so Jeremy, for the benefit of uh, yeah. the audience, the uh, link is uh, in the Q and A. Uh, it's come through as an announcement. You should see a link that you can click on. Excellent. So if you can start opening that link and get clicking, we'll see uh, whether people um, see whether people uh, what people think about the definition, the correct definition of rail interoperability. I think we are starting to get some uh, views. Good. I'll give it a little bit more time just to work through and then I will move on. And let's just refresh. Thank you, Hannah, for reminding me. So we, 37 responses. Excellent. Excellent. Good. Right. I'm going to leave it at that point. Very glad. Let's just get the screen up again. Very glad to see that um, over half of you um, saw it as a set of common standards and processes. Um, quite a few of you also saw it as a means of ensuring um, that, the, that, the, that, that the system works together and, uh, and, and is compatible as well. Um, I think both of those two um, I think we would see as um, acceptable answers. I can see one or two questions about uh, um, these being European requirements that are not really relevant anymore to the mainland red, red railway. Also some responses uh, saying that these um, involve a complex um, set of rules and processes. But I think um, th those pretty much, I think answers pretty much reflect our uh, I, I think our views and just back to the presentation. Um, here is there we are. What is interoperability? So um, I think basically it's a um, it's derived from EU, EU regulations, um, but it is now in, established in UK law. It involves a common set of standards and processes for rolling stock infrastructure and components, and the aims are to improve cost efficiency, transparency and system wide compatibility up through greater standardisation. So that's really the aims of interoperability. Um, moving on, so there are a range of different standards in use in the UK. I know uh, a number of people quite often um, find that quite, quite confusing. So there are some EU standards, there are TSIs, there are Euro norms. There are 
Um, standards that are published by DFT, so the National Technical Specification Notices, National Technical Rules, and then there are a range of group and industry standards owned by the industry through RSSB and company specific standards are mostly owned by Network Rail. Um, in this session, the primary focus, our primary focus is going to be on NTSNs and NTRs because those are really the most directly governed by our interoperability legislation, although the legislation also provides a framework for other standards such as the rail, railways group standards as well. Um, steps in the process, and I know Joe's going to cover this in a little bit more detail, but from our perspective, the process is essentially as follows. Standards need to be applied right from the start of a project. Um, there is an option of seeking exemptions, again, as early as possible, um, and a process then of third party checks and ORR authorizations, um, after which a subsystem can then be placed into service. So that is that is the theory. I think in practice, fair to say that we, you know, we recognise that interoperability um, has not been without its critics, and there have been arguments made both for and against it. And we're aware that supporters argue that it ensures fit for purpose railway assets, uh, which are compatible with one another, um, improve efficiency and reduce costs. We also recognise that, um, you know, arguments that um, interoperability provides important protections for the freight and international um, freight industry and international trade, uh, all of which have a very strongly intra international focus. On the other hand, we're aware that critics of the system um, have argued that it can be bureaucratic, it can encourage risk aversion and over engineering, and that the industry may be better placed um, than government. To, encourage, uh, to manage this, uh, manage its own standardisation within an overarching safety framework. Well, there will be opportunities to test all this, and this is really now leading into um, the second part of our presentation. Um, and the opportunities for change um, have not been greater than they, uh, they currently are. So now we've left the EU, we're now wholly responsible um, for the content of our NTSNs and NTRs, obviously con subject to consultation requirements and uh, um, a requirement to inform Parliament. Um, there are separate processes in place for, um, um, for the Channel Tunnel and Northern Ireland though, but I think what I've said is broadly true for the UK or for the GB mainland railway. There are also a lot more opportunities um, for um, operators to seek exemptions or um, disapplications from certain standards or authorization requirements. And all of these exist under the existing legislation. And we no longer have to consult the EU on these. We've got the choice of doing um, uh, uh, of doing these ourselves. Um, on the right hand side of my slide, we've also got a lot more control of the regulatory framework. We now have the power to change it if we wish to do so. And I provided some illustrative examples in the slide below of the kind of things that we might do if, if we chose to do so. Uh, again, a lot of that is going to be um, covered in more detail in the subsequent slides. So um, the opportunities for change are, going, are very much the focus of the remaining slides. And I'm going to hand over to Joe in a second just to talk about some of the freedoms that we're already exploring as part of some trials that we've been working together on um, with Network Rail. Um, I'll then, Joe will then hand back over to me and I'll pick up the broader um, question about wider regulatory reform uh, at the end of this presentation. So without more ado, over to Joe. Okay, hello. Hello, can you hear me yet? Hello, I'm Jo Griffiths and I'm a Senior Programme Engineering Manager in the Technical Authority Systems Engineering team within Network Rail. And I'm the Network Rail lead for the um, theme for interoperability. But what are we looking at in terms of interoperability under speed? Well, first we need to understand the project challenges. Now I myself have been fortunate enough to deliver a large number of authorizations 
So I, I did have a view on the challenges the process in the regulation can have, but what about other regions and other projects? What were the issues they saw? And if you can move on to the next slide, please. Talking to the projects who were going through the speed thinking, these are the key messages that were coming out. As you will see from the slide, the focus is around the process, not the technical specifications, the NTSNs, which are the ones that give you the interoperable capability. So if projects found the process complex, difficult to manage in project timeframes, and saw the process as a risk to their project that it was being applied to, and this led to frustration, lack of timely compliance and possible delays to use of the new infrastructure or even restrictions to use. Now, it's not just frustration for the projects, but it's also for the third party verification who become time squeezed and placed under pressure to deliver their elements expediently. And of course, the ORR, who are the end signatory, sometimes having to make difficult decisions on authorizations. So our focus needed to be on the process. And thus the theme mission was born. Next slide, please. Our mission is to make a process of declaring an, in, an infrastructure interoperable capability more efficient and timely. But how do you do this? Well, let's have a look at the process for making a change to the railway in its simplest form. Interoperability is a process to get the the ability to declare, to get to the ability to declare an interoperable capability of the network. As network rail, we declare all of the network capability through our annual returns, regardless of whether it's interoperable or not. So as you can see from this basic diagram, when we make a change to the network, we do this from a process defined in our health and safety management system and declare a capability. The question is, why do we do an additional process on top just because it's an interoperable capability? And why can we not use the existing processes which is deemed perfectly acceptable for non-interoperable capability? They both require network rail to assure a safe, compatible and integrated railway system before allowing the infrastructure to be used. And this is as required by other governing legislation such as ROGS, the Railway and Other Guided System Safety, and of course the Health and Safety at Work Act. And we have to maintain the capability we declare. So we wanted to look at how we can reach this interoperable capability in a different way. We first need to look at the current process in a little bit more de detail. So on the next slide, you can see this. So this is the process that looks for a typical infrastructure project authorising under the SG module. So that's the provision of design and production evidence to a third party verification body or an approved body under the regulation. The timeframes in red are those a project should be planning for as a minimum. They sometimes happen sooner, which equals pressure for those involved and puts the project at risk if not planned properly. Now you know that most of our railway projects occur in blockades, the favourites being Christmas and Easter and the one that's coming, the August Bank holiday. And we do this to, to ensure minimum passenger disruption. Now this leads to a lot of the production evidence not being ready until after that blockade. So that's the build and test evidence. But we want to open and use the railway once the blockade is lifted. This results in a back-ended race to APIS, which can lead to technical files from approved bodies missing production information because we need the file to submit the for an authorization to the ORR. So we can open and use the new subsystem elements. And trying to manage then that missing information through addendums or conditions or restrictions on the authorization. On some projects, this can lead to a lag between entry into service readiness and the actual opening or use, for example, a new station. This can also increase risk and pressure on authorization when the project really needs to be focused on the entry into service, which is a safe integrated system. As remember, not all elements of a project may be going for authorization. For example, you may have a project that includes changes to some class B signaling systems. So we have looked at other means to obtain the same result, i.e. the ability to declare an interoperable capability with the focus on progressive assurance and try to avoid this N rush or lack of use and ensure we pick up any issues early in the process. Now, the next slide 
shows you um, the steps of the current process and the alternative proposed process side by side. Again, both SG modules are being used. In orange, I've highlighted the steps that have been reduced or removed to make the assurance more efficient and stopping assurance on assurance that is not cost effective. The process also removes formal certification and formal ORR APIS letter, but, and I want to make this absolutely clear, it does not remove independent review of the application of the technical compliance to achieve interoperability, i.e. compliance to the NTSNs and NTRs. Nor does it remove the ORR completely as they will be involved as an oversight through the process and inputting during rather than at the end. It also doesn't change the initial ratification. Of course, a project needs to know whether it's applying um, an interoperable capability or not. And also the requirements to maintain an interoperable subsystem will remain the same, just as we have to maintain all our declared capability. At this stage, I'm not saying this is the new process. It needs to be trialled, and that is what this theme is currently doing. You can see on the right for the trial, we have um, an approved body oversight of what is now the independent competent person. The reason for this is that we want to make sure that any information accepted by the independent competent person of demonstration of compliance is of the same quality as expected for an approved body to produce their technical file. And NCB have kindly offered to do this role. Now we will be trialling this on the Northumberland line. And if we move to the next slide, it's just a reminder. Um, the Northumberland line has presented in a previous in the previous um, speed theme meetings. So this is just really a quick recap, and I'm probably not doing it as much justice as they did the first time. But the goal of the Northumberland project, if you remember, is to is to upgrade a freight line to a passenger line and include a new hourly peak half hourly service. So this includes um, introduction of either DMUs or hybrid diesel and electric hybrid trains. It also requires new track work, passing loops and six new stations, along with the associated upgrades to things like level crossings and the Class B signalling system. Now, in order not to apply the interoperability process, and remember that interoperability is legislation, so it is law in the UK, we actually need a dispensation from the competent authority, in this case, the DFT. Um, in the first instance, we were hoping to apply it to all the elements I've highlighted in green and orange, as these are the elements that are declaring an interoperable capability. But due to the nature of the works at stations, which were new and the line and the track works were an upgrade, it could not be excluded from the regulation process. Um, this took quite a lot of legal debate and understanding um, within the regulation, looking at new versus upgrade. But in the end, we have selected the items in green only that are, will form part of the trial, while the items in orange will continue through the existing process. Now, because we spent a lot of time talking about um, what was new and what was an upgrade and what where interoperability applies, I want to ask you a question, if I may. So thinking about this question and thinking about the projects you work on, do you think it's really clear on which infrastructure projects the interoperability regulations apply? And this is a simple yes or no in the chat, please. Could you make that, um, could you make that decision? OK, so that's interesting. So it's just sways to the no. OK, I, I'll, I'll wait a little bit longer. We'll have another refresh. It's swaying more to the no. That's interesting. We're going to do one more refresh. OK, we will we will leave it. Oh, we're going for another refresh, are we, Jeremy? <laughs> 
OK, we, we will leave it there because that's quite a number of responses. No. Now, I'm really pleased it came out majority no, because I'm actually a system review panel chair and a panel member of NRAP. And sometimes it can be quite difficult to make that call. And it's something um, separate to the trial that we're going to be working with the DFT to improve going forward. So what about the trial? Where are we? If we go to the next slide, Jeremy. Well, we formed a working group between Network Rail, the DFT, the ORR and RSSB. We have obtained our um, legal agreement not to apply the regulation or the law to the track elements that I showed you in green earlier. That is called a Regulation 13 decision. So now we're legally allowed to perform the trial and use the alternative process. We prepared a trial document. We've been briefing the teams. We've agreed the competencies and independent of for the trial of the independent competent person. And this will be again assessed as the trial commences. We've also applied CSM RA, and I don't mean to the Northumberland line, that's um, CSM significant. I mean to actually the change in process, which has been extremely useful because it's helped us pick out some of the things we need to keep an eye on and mitigate and look at going forward should the trial be a success. It's helped us also to look at some measures and KPIs we will be monitoring during the trial. And as the lead system integrator for Northumberland Line, ACOM have already produced their project authorisation strategy and the matrices we're using. So the trial has already commenced. And most importantly, um, the trial should help inform whether changes need to be made to the interoperability regulation, depending, of course, of the outcome of the recent post implementation review, which Jeremy is going to discuss next. Over to you, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Joe. A perfect handover, and uh, I do feel um, some of your pain um, um, going through the trial. So, as Joe says, I'm just going to finish with a few words about the post implementation review that we're running um, on the uh, rail interoperability um, regulations. So first, first of all, what is a, um, a post implementation or post implementation review? Well, first thing is these are things that are actually baked into the regulations themselves. Um, so they are a, a, a legal requirement and generally they take place every five years. And they require us to review the effectiveness of regulations, um, whether they're serving their intended purpose and whether the aims can be achieved more effectively. So they can, when done properly, um, can actually be a very, very valuable opportunity to take stock. Um, and these particular ones are um, significant um, because they come at a point just after uh, we've left the EU where we now have much greater freedom to determine our own um, regulatory framework. Um, they also come at a point where um, in project speed, where we're looking to deliver things much more efficiently, much lower cost, obviously without compromising our safety. So a review actually is very, very helpful. This review is very, very helpful in getting us um, the intelligence, the understanding of stakeholder views um, at this critical point and actually could also have broader um, importance as well as we shape up our policy following the, the Williams Chaps white paper. The, the important thing I just want to get across here though is that our position, so the department's position at the moment on the PIR is neutral. So we are going into this with no preconceived plans for change um, and we're seeking as wide a range of views as possible. So we are genuinely keen to hear the views of stakeholders and we're open to, the, to ideas for change. We're also open to arguments against change as well. So this is a very, very important point um, at which you know, we're very keen to hear um, stakeholder voices. Um, just in terms of timelines, so we have been running a survey for the last few weeks. And I know a number of um, RIA members have already um, contributed to that. Um, and RIA has been closely involved in that uh, process. Um, the survey closed 
um, um, last Monday. And thank you to everyone who's responded. So we will be looking at this um, over looking at the responses to the consultation over the summer. Um, so over the, the remains of July, the remains and then the rest of August uh, with a view to putting some advice up to ministers um, in, in the autumn. Um, we are required by law to publish a final report in January 2022. There's actually quite a long sort of parliamentary and clearance process that leads up to that. Um, so it may be that at that point we're not at the we're not quite ready to um, um, set out a detailed set of change proposals, but we are very, very keen that we use our report to set a direction of travel if we can. And there may well need to be, almost certainly need to be, further testing of options, further consultations, discussions with the industry, um, depending on the, uh, the type of views expressed during the PIR survey and also the range of views expressed. And as I said earlier in my presentation, I think we're aware that different parts of the industry may have different views and we're very keen to, to, to to flush those out. So lots and lots of opportunities here, uh, opportunities for us to um, think about um, changes within the legislative framework, the existing legislative change framework, possibly think about changes to the legislative framework as well, and also opportunities to think about this in the broader context um, of rail reform um, as set out in the Williams Shapps paper. Um, so that was all I was going to say about the post implementation review. I really wanted to um, emphasize its, its significance and importance. And I wanted to end up um, on a final question to you all, really to ask what changes you would like to see to the legislation in Great Britain. This is a very, very quick um, straw poll, but uh, uh, potentially quite uh, valuable. Um, source of information for us. There we are. So, um, oh, excellent. Getting some words up already. Yep. So taken in house, simplified, harmonized, clearer, self assurance. OK, I'll just leave this up a little bit longer to allow people the opportunity to um, to contribute, because I think this could be quite a quite a helpful takeaway for us from this um, from this workshop. OK. OK, quite important, quite some quite key terms here. Looks like simplified um, is the is the term that uh, um, is having most resonance with people here. Simplified, clearer. I'll give it a couple, just give it one more minute, perhaps I'll do a couple more refreshes and then I think we'll see if we can capture the uh, the results of that um, um, as part of the record of the workshop. There we go, 43. Good. I'll do two more chain, two more refreshes, and then I think we'll leave it there. OK, I think there are some quite clear messages coming out of that, which is helpful to helpful to see. Right, final refresh. OK. 
good. Good, thank you. Thank you. That is helpful. Well, there may be opportunities for people to keep feeding in um, while this poll is open, but um, I shall move on um, in terms of the presentation and hand back to David for questions, I think. Thank you very much, Jeremy, um, and thank you uh, to you and Joe for uh, such a clear uh, presentation. Clear being one of the one of the words that came up very strongly in that in that uh, word cloud. Um, so just to kick off with the first question, the, the looking you know picking up on the word cloud, it had uh, phrases like uh, sim various phrases uh, around simplification that came out quite strongly. Clarity. Efficiency was in there as well. Um, that seems like strong support for what you're doing uh, with speed. So um, it's really encouraging to see that Joe is, uh, you know, that the, there's the trial on uh, the Thumberland line. But you know, speed speed means speed. You know, how quickly can we expect that to to roll out and us get to those simplified and clarified and efficient processes? Would you do you want to pick that up, Jeremy, and then maybe Joe come in as well? You're muted, Jeremy. Yeah. Apologies. Actually, Joe, do you want to lead off on the trial, just in terms of sort of how quickly you would see that one coming? to fruition and then I'll pick up on sort of what we might do with the outputs. Yes. So the whole the whole um, you saw in my presentation, the whole point of monitoring and having a look and assessing the trial as it takes form and moves forward is to maybe look at um, whether it's a peak you know, approaching success or whether it's completely the wrong thing to do and obviously we need to start looking at that trend before we widen it out to other projects but if we do start seeing a positive trend it's likely that we'll be approaching the DFT with agreement with the RR to maybe widen that trial pool because you're right this is about speed and it might be that the best option is to widen the trial but again you know this is law and we have to apply the law as it stands today so we'd have to have full agreement and regulation decisions for that. And I would just pick up on that. So I would see this informing two things, two discrete things from our side. So I think one, looking at options within the existing regulations of um, doing this in future for future projects, using the learning from this um, and using the the, um, the 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 routes that we already have under Regulation 13 and 14. But I think this is also quite useful to us in context of the broader um, post implementation review, because actually it may suggest some opportunities um, to change or to streamline the regulations themselves as well. Um, so again, as I say, you know, we are currently neutral on this, but I think we will be looking to use the results of the, um, the PIR exercise and obviously other learnings to start to pull together um, some ideas um, to test about change. So th thank you, Jeremy that, and, and Joe for that. Uh, there's quite a lot of questions coming in, but please don't hesitate to uh, put a question in the Q&A and I'll, I'll ask Jeremy and, and, and Joe uh, that question. I've got a question that just follows on nicely from what you were, say, you were saying just now. Um, you're saying, then the question is, why is DFT's position neutral? Why not be more enthusiastic on opportunities to rationalise the process? Um, so I just wondered, uh, Jeremy, if you'd like to pick that one up. Yes, by all means. So I think, again, two reasons for this. One is a procedural reason and one is probably a policy reason. Um, I think the first reason is um, there is a, um, a very, very established set of principles guiding um, post implementation reviews. And those principles really do require us to um, ask open questions, not to prejudge and to follow a, you know, to follow a very, very rigorous process um, 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 in terms of asking the questions we ask about the, the, the regulations. And that has conditioned um, to quite an extent the questions that we've asked. I think the second reason for this is um, that, um, you know, we genuinely 
want to hear what stakeholders think. So I think you know we have a um, you know we have a um, a clear agenda um, in terms of you know wanting to improve efficiency, make things simpler, more efficient, reduce red tape where we can. However, we also recognise that there are some very very important protections here, and so I think. By positioning ourselves as, as very neutral at this stage, what we hope to do is really get provide the opportunity um, for for um, stakeholders to to provide all of those arguments, um, then which we can then um, look at. So, um, you know, when I say we genuinely don't have any preconceived views or ideas for change, um, that is absolutely right. There are not at this stage some thoughts that we have. Um, about how we, you know, what what we would do away with, gen, gen, genuinely so. Okay. so. Thank, thank you, Jeremy. Um, the um, a question which might you mentioned regulations thirteen and fourteen, and they might might be part of the answer to to a couple of questions we've got here. We've got one question saying from Tim Evans saying. Um, if you made the Northumberland line part of the Tyne and Weir Metro, would the interoperability rules have applied to the station? Uh, question mark. I, I think by extension, you can also say, would they have applied to the whole route? Question mark. Um, and there's another there's another question which is about interested in more detail. This is from Martin Devlin. Interested in more detail on justification for treating stations differently to track. Um, so, and I, I might not have been listening closely enough. I, I wasn't quite sure you said that, but uh, you, you um, who, who, would you yeah. like to close up, Joe? Or, or yeah, I, I can start. What was the first question again? Could you just repeat? So, so the first question was, had the Tyne and, had the Tyne and Weir Metro been uh, operating, the, intended to operate the, uh, um, the Northumberland line, would you have needed the stations to be interoperable? So the answer to that, if it was um, if it was a metro system instead of a heavy rail system, then um, the interoperability regulations are are not applicable to metro systems, as it says in the front of the regulation. So no <laughs> would be the answer, I guess, in short. Yeah, I, I wonder. I wonder if there's a subtext to that, which is asking. You know, I could I could speculate that the subtext to that is. Well, if it's good enough for a metro and it's fit for purpose for passengers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, why would why would the heavy rail, you know, why would a heavy rail station need to be uh, approved in a different way, in a you know, or potentially a more onerous way than than a metro? Yeah. Shall I try and pick that one up, David? And I think this sort of perhaps oh, goes goes to. The sort of origins and of the interoperability regulations, which are about system compatibility, allowing trains to run on tracks, etc., and very much conceived as part of a vision of a sort of trans-European uh, rail network, where trains could literally get from you know one part of Europe um, through to another, and very much using the heavy rail system. So again, my my team may correct me, but my understanding is that is sort of broadly speaking uh, the rationale for the distinction between um, heavy rail um, and light rail. Um, Again, with the, the 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 view there that light rail will tend to be more for um, local um, systems and not there, therefore necessarily part of that broader um, um, national or supranational um, rail network. But as I say, you know, um, everything is well. Potentially, things are up for grabs now. So if people. Um, um, you know, see ways of doing this differently or want to suggest ways of doing this differently. This is, you know, the opportunity to uh, tell us. So um, the, the point that was made earlier, um, uh, Joe made the point that this, this, this is legislation, um, but correct me if I'm wrong, you're already with speed, you're already identifying things where you can simplify the process and you're taking out, you know, quite a chunk of of time, or I think Joe, you were specifying a maximum time for the tail end of the process. Um, that's the sort of first part of the question, which might Joe, you might want to pick up pick up on. You know, how much can we do without changing legislation? Is 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 really the question. And and one for um, Jeremy to think about, maybe as a follow on. Um, 
I mentioned regulation 13 and 14. Perhaps you could clarify to the audience what they are for, but I think they give you the, the, the flexibility to do a certain amount of carve out. Um, so, Joe, on, on, the, on, on the point about how much can we do, how, how significant a change can we make without legislation? Without legislation change, I mean, um, mentioning the regulation 13, which is specific to upgrades and renewals, um, we could look um, and under the regulations, the DFT are, out, are allowed to publish a list which are defined as regulations and renewals. So there is an opportunity to maybe consider what would come fall under the regulations for renewals and upgrades and what um, wouldn't fall under the regulations for renewals and upgrade, which would probably help with some clarity on where interoperability should be applied. So there is that opportunity. Um, and there's the, there's opportunity um, which we've used before within Network Rail on um, the when the authorization should take place. Um, some some items like new stations, because it's all about when you put it into use for the first time, which it's been designed for. So for for things like new stations, obviously the first time it's used for passengers is what it's been designed for. For some um, existing upgrades and renewals to subsystems, this could be tied to a configuration state to the railway, such as a timetable change. So there are some flexibilities, but it doesn't simplify the process, but it just kind of eases, I guess, the back end rush um, or hockey stick of information. And I've, yeah. I've used some of those already with the number of authorizations I've done. Yeah. But to me, we're still following that assurance and assurance process, and we really need to look at that as well. I think just just to add to that, so, uh, so regulations 13 and 14, um, I think regulation 14 in particular, um, provide they, they provide quite a lot of opportunity to disapply standards or um, um, parts of standards. Um, there's obviously a process that uh, um, needs to be gone through in order to do that, but there is scope there to do that. And there are, you know, there is scope to um, to dispense with certain requirements as well, particularly the authorization requirement, which is what we've been looking at under regulation 13 in the in the Northumberland pilot. Now, I think there was a question about why stations were why, why, why there was a distinction between track and stations. And again, Joe will be able to, 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 to answer that. But my understanding here is that that actually is really due to the the way that the regulations have been written and particularly regulation 13, it applies to upgrades and renewals. Um, it doesn't therefore apply to certain enhancements. And I think when we were looking at this, we were looking at the, the opportunities um, for stations to be covered under this, this, this process. And I think it was, a, it was a legal view rather than a policy view that that was um, um, outside the scope of the current regulations. Thanks, Jeremy, for that uh, for that clarification and, and also Joe for your answer too. Um, there's a question around scope here. Um, so um, the, the, and a simple question, is this for infrastructure only or is this also on rolling stock? Now, I I'm, I'm, think I'm right in saying that speed is essentially all about all about infrastructure. And, and rolling stock will be, you know, is dealt with elsewhere, as it were. Is that a correct assumption, uh, Jeremy? Um, so I think speed, the primary focus is definitely on um, on infrastructure. Um, and, you know, that's why we've been working with Network Rail on the Northumberland pilots. But the um, the scope of the regulations themselves go broader and therefore the scope of our post implementation review goes broader as well and i think people should not assume that the um, the scope of the pir is limited to the things that we've been looking at in projects in relation to project speed um, there is genuinely opportunity there are genuinely opportunities to change um, the whole um, set of regulations and um, you know opportunities for stakeholders to um, put in ideas for change or arguments against change in relation to the wider aspects of the regulations. 
Th thank you. That that thanks. And that that goes. That picks up um, a question. There's a bit of a discussion going on in in the Q and A because uh, Neil Ovend and one of our later panelists has very helpfully um, answered part of the question. So there's a question, and and you know, Jeremy, that Ria is concerned about this. That we inadvertently create a GB bespoke market, and in extremists, we end up with a situation where. Uh, a GB manufacturer has a production line for things they're selling around the world and a production line they're selling uh, for selling things in the UK. And 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 we obviously want to avoid that. And, and uh, uh, Anonymous has picked that up as an issue and uh, and highlighted it and also highlighted the lack of the, a supply chain pipeline uh, might lead to suppliers concentrating on a bigger, more homogenous EU market. You know, so the the worst of all worlds would be not enough pipeline to even you know, to really justify uh, keeping the UK pipeline, keeping the UK yeah. production line busy. Um, so, uh, and Neil Neil in his response is agreeing with that uh, and and saying really we we mustn't uh, risk export potential. And therefore, uh, we should ideally constrain this being interoperability to large civil enhancements and not rolling stock and complex digital signaling projects. So I think what he means is not can not yeah. vary away from things that are complex systems like rolling stock yeah. and, and digital signaling. Yeah. Is that how is, do, what are your thoughts on that? So that is, I think, I think I, I reflected that or I tried to reflect that view in my slide on arguments for and against interoperability and I think that slide recognised the importance of the interoperability uh, regulations in protecting not just UK freight industry which is very international but also um, the supply chain's interests as well and that is again one of the reasons one of the policy reasons why we are genuinely you know we we are very um, consciously, very deliberately, um, not starting with preconceived ideas here. Um, we genuinely want to hear what people um, think and say, and we're very keen to hear uh, not just ideas for how to change things, but also um, the arguments to the contrary. And I think it's very, very important that we um, our decisions are informed by both sets of arguments. So if, if if a stakeholder wanted to make a case for um, uh, um, for any scope of reform to be limited to infrastructure, let's say, rather than other things, that is something I think we would we would you know we would look at. Um, you know, we would be very keen to hear uh, those kind of views. Equally, if we wanted, you know, if a, if a stakeholder thought that we could uh, dispense with everything, um, we would want to look at, uh, um, you know, we would want to consider those views as well. Um, but ultimately, you know, we will need to make a judgment call um, based on what we think is um, best for the for the railway as a whole. Thank you, and and that's really from a um, a post implementation review uh, point. Because I, I think there's a couple of things coming up in the uh, in in the Q and A that indicate that when we're giving our responses, we should probably be clear whether we're talking about PIR or or speed. I think potentially um, we're, we're, um, some of the audience might be finding that a little bit hard to hard to follow. Um, I. I'm uh, going to pick up some of the questions that have got quite a few votes uh, against them. Or, um, and there's one from An Andy Norris. Um, and I think this sort of reflects what your your, your word cloud, and it, it's, it's a statement really rather than a question. Uh, it says some important terms are not 100% clear or understood. You know, uh, APIS, uh, so approval to place into service, entry into service, putting into service, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I guess the subtext to that is short of legislation. We, well, we've we've made it more complicated, haven't we? Because we've now got EU regulations and we've got um, we've got NTSNs and so forth. Things we've had to do post Brexit. So how can we how can we be as clear and simple as we can about language? So I yeah. 
So I can kick off the answer to this. Within Network Rail, we're currently updating our um, standards around CSM and interoperability um, to make sure that the terminology such as authorization to place into service, entry into service, placing into service, putting into use, there's many, many terms are very clear so people understand what we're talking about and when, and it's crossed with other standards, not just the ones specific to CSM and interoperability, to make sure of the consistency with the help for, to people that, to understand what we're talking about and what stage we're talking about. So that's what we're doing within Network Rail at the moment. Okay, that, that, that's, that's, that's really helpful. And just an extension on that, Joe, um, as, um, as you develop new, and I guess this applies across the whole of speed, but as you develop new um, processes and streamlined processes and so forth, how are those going to be shared with industry? They, do they become standards or some kind of controlled document or you know, how do we spread the good news, the best practice? Um, within Network Rail, um, any changes will come through a standards update, which will be briefed in our normal standard distribution way through, through to the supply chain. OK, thank you. Um, Another couple of popular questions. Well, one's a statement. I think one of one's a question. Um, so the, the 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 statement or the suggestion, which is wanted to, for us all to probably to take away, is to review the language we use and stop using supply chain and start using delivery partners instead in instead of supply chain. Which is, yeah, you know, I think there's um, the, there's a subtlety in there which I think is important. Uh, the word partners. I, I suspect that's what. Uh, anonymous was was thinking about when writing that, um, so I'd be interested in in your your views on that. But Jeremy, the question is, uh, you heard us say every project should apply project speed now, um, and the question is, how does that impact on projects in flight currently? I guess well, Joe will have more practical understanding of this than I will, but I guess it will depend where those projects are in those in their life cycles um, and what opportunities there are to apply the project speed uh, thinking. But I, I mean, a lot of this is about this isn't just about process change. This is about sort of culture change, getting people into different mindsets. And I think we would argue that those kind of changes can happen um, now they can happen at any stage of any project in flight and it's really about asking those questions and really challenging yourself and challenging you know upwards challenging your supply your suppliers or your delivery partners um, challenging challenging the department where you can see opportunities to think to do things um, better Thank you, Joe. Would you like to? Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yes. Obviously, it will always depend on where you are in the grip or pace cycle, as it is now called. Obviously, if you're at the um, beginning of a project, there's more opportunity than there is at the end. But as um, Jeremy said, there's nothing stopping any project just taking on board some of the speed themes and applying them. You know, this is all about: are we doing the right thing for the industry? Abs abs absolutely. Um, so there's um, just to, just to say to everybody, there's a chance for a, f a few more questions. Uh, we're, we're due to we're due to finish at uh, 1420. So there's 10 minutes more uh, for, for questions. Um, we've got a, a, a question here, which again has been very helpfully answered by Neil Obenden. Uh, so just for the benefit of the wider audience, um, so it's um, a supplier talking about some predictive maintenance technology that they have finding is taking time to get through product acceptance and they're wondering whether um, that uh, the network rail team are overloaded with other projects and can that be resolved through through speed uh, so neil neil's had a, a go at answering that and folks and it's highlighted that speeds currently constrained to network rail infrastructure enhancement projects and therefore Whilst the philosophy of speed might apply, strictly speaking, uh, it's outside of that. Neil's very helpfully offered uh, to, to uh, the opportunity to share details of where, where and what it is that's stuck in the process. 
Um, but if, if, if I can turn that into a, a question, is, you know, this is about a product uh, and there are many out there that uh, offer the opportunity for, for, for innovation and improving per performance. So uh, do, you, do you have thoughts, Jeremy or Joe, about how we can, um, uh, what um, speed can do to help us um, bring those uh, through to fruition? That's, that's so I think that, yes. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> I think there's probably different layers of answering that, aren't there, at the project level and then perhaps overall. Do you want to do you want to start with the project level? Yes, I was going to say we do have our standards challenge, which does include process challenge because of course product acceptance is a standard within network rail so it, you know there's opportunity to, st to challenge that process within the standards challenge framework which is a theme under speed so there is that opportunity there good point and i think more broadly um we are very very keen to involve um our rail delivery partners and i should use the term delivery partners we might want to have a debate afterwards, um, David, whether that's something you would like um, us to use, a term we'd like us to use um, um, in the discussion. And that's part of the reason for having this sort of this forum here. And we've, you know, we're looking, we're looking for ideas as well. So I think if there are things that um, people spot that they think could be more broadly applied, either coming out of a, um, um, a, a specific project or on a broader theme. Um, I think we're in the market for, for ideas. Good news, you, you, you heard it here. Uh, so so thank, th thank you, Jeremy. I'm just uh, answer, I'm typing out an answer to one of the, one of the other questions. Um, so one of, there's a question here, um, reminding us that one of the aims of the interoperability directive was to prevent barriers to trade by promoting a single European market. Um, and so that's a variation on the question I was asking before about the two different uh, production lines. Uh, so how if if potentially for a UK mm -hmm. supplier, manufacturer, delivery partner, we have um, uh, there is a uh, theoretically at least a reduced opportunity to sell into Europe. What are what are the what are the tools available to government to try and rebalance that? Okay, so I think that's a that is a very hypothetical question, and that um, assumes that we that we choose to use our freedoms in a particular way, and I don't think we're at that stage yet. So I think our first, you know, our, our first consideration would be to, to really to understand um, the impacts of any potential change on um, on on um, international markets and um, um, look to you know, we would we would need to 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 weigh up the, 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 the pros and cons of change in the light of that. So I think it's probably a little bit premature to jump to a an assumption that we will be um, 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 sort of using freedoms in a way that 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 would compromise our firms' abilities to to, um, um, to to trade or sell into international markets, and plenty of opportunities for um, for people to to to. to to tell to tell us of the pitfalls if they choose you know if they if they believe that there are pitfalls or or, or risks then uh, there will be plenty of opportunities for people to tell us of those so that we can take decisions in the round in, in including through your trade association um so so this question here is probably a Joe question, which is NRAP, which as we all know is the Network Rail Approvals Panel, is overloaded um, and not responsive is the assertion. Uh, routes rely upon SRP, Systems Review Panel, for support, but SRP is not empowered to fully endorse on behalf of NRAP. 
Will Network Rail be able to refine the bureaucracy uh, via speed? Uh, so interested in your views on that, uh, Joe. Uh, it's quite I do have quite an interesting view because I am both an system review panel chair and an N, now an NRAP panel member. And um, what I've been trialling in the region where I am the system review panel, which is Wales and Western, I do have those delegate authorities from NRAP to endorse these projects. So there is an opportunity to look at how we can widen that further to the regions to help and support NRAP deliver more. So we're already thinking in that circle. OK, good. So I think I think the simple answer to that question is yes and already on it. So uh, thank you. I've just posted a, um, in the chat a feedback form, which when we break in a few minutes, I'd be grateful if when we have the break, if you wouldn't mind filling in the feed, taking a couple of minutes of your break to fill in that that, that feedback, that would be that would be very helpful so that we know whether we're hitting the spots here or not. Um, there's a question here which may be getting towards our last or last couple of questions. Um, some interoperable projects have residual actions post delivery. How on network rail ensuring these these projects have visibility and who will have the responsibility for completing these late actions, knowing the project managers usually move on to the next project before the grip seven has even commenced. Now I think that's not so much about speed, but it's a bit you know that's that's today's situation. Um, is there a speed way to improve on that? So I will take that question. It's interesting because there is a process to control them. It's written in our standards <laughs> and it's actually um, part of what the SRP chair does in monitoring them and ensuring that the project do close them out. And if there are residual items such as restrictions, making sure that they are transferred to the infrastructure manager who then for becomes the project entity under the regulations thereafter, under regulation 19. So the process is already there. Um, and most projects, well, projects can't close out, so they can't do handback without those items being closed if they're conditions on the authorization, because you 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 haven't finished the work, so you can't do the handback. So I, I'm not sure um, on the full question, but the process is there today and we do follow it, I assure you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's uh, this this one's probably more more of a statement uh, than anything. It's more training and clear training is vital to the excess success of the interoperability compliance process, which sounds like good advice. Um, I think probably the last question here uh, is is an interesting interesting one. Um, and I, you you touched on independence, Joe, but anonymous here is asking. Is network rail best place to determine whether it's compliant with legislation or not? That's interesting because network rail has to determine whether it's compliant with all the legislation it currently has to comply with. And of course, the RR, the oversight to that on behalf of the DFT. So what is the difference within today's railway? I guess. Absolutely. Um, so um, with that, I think we we come to the point where um, uh, I'd like to thank our, our speakers uh, for uh, their um, uh, excellent contribution. Really, really good discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for um, participating in, all, in the uh, Q&A. If we can imagine a virtual round of applause, uh, it's rippling round the round the room now. So thank you very much for your contribution, Jeremy and uh, Joe. And um, we uh, we will be back at. Uh, we're taking a break now. We'll be back at fourteen thirty-five after a fifteen-minute break uh, with the procurement uh, work stream, where we'll be welcoming welcoming uh, camera. Uh, well, Ju um, Jimmy Ogunfua. Uh, from DFT and Cameron Burns from Network Rail who will present on procurement. And just one last reminder, if I could ask you if you wouldn't mind filling in that um, Q&A, uh, the, the feedback form, that'd be very welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, so see you all back at 1535. Enjoy your cup of tea and thank you once again to the speakers.